How many of you guys grew up going on camping trips, fishing trips, and the like? I myself never really went on many fishing trips, but I do enjoy the act of fishing. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. It's good to see you made it back for another episode. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true fishing horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. Now, as always, if you have a story you would like to share in a future video, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that truly help keep this show going. Now, let's get into these creepy and allegedly true middle of nowhere horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. This is not my personal story, but one my aunt told me about. It was the early 2000s. I was a small child at the time and my aunt had set off with my other aunt for a fishing trip on the Washita River in Arkansas. On their way there, they stopped at the local store for snacks and drinks. They got their business done in the store and were on their way once again. They arrived at the boat ramp around 2.30pm and set up their fishing gear. They fished for a few hours, catching a couple of fish, but mostly just passing the time by talking. They talked and talked until nightfall. Thinking they should probably pack up and head out, they began to gather their fishing gear and pack up. Before they reached the vehicle though, a white sedan pulled into the boat ramp area. My oldest aunt could make out two figures in the vehicle. Instead of proceeding, they hid behind some rocks and watched them closely waiting for them to get out. Almost positive the people in the car had not seen them, they stayed behind those rocks for some time, contemplating on what exactly they should do. From the angle they were at, they could tell that the car had the driver's side door blocked. They sat there for a while, waiting for the car to pull out of the parking lot, but it never did. So, with barely any service, my oldest aunt managed to get a hold of my uncle and tell him about the mysterious white car hindering them from getting in and leaving. With no hesitation, being the big bad dude my uncle is, he was on his way. Several minutes had passed, but eventually, my aunt could see the headlights of my uncle pulling into the ramp parking area. About the time he stepped out, a pistol on his hip, that is when the white car roared to life and sped out of there. In relief, my two aunts shaken up from the experience came out from behind the rocks. They wanted to follow the car, but with no knowledge of the direction it went, they decided not to, and reported the incident to the authorities instead. Nothing ever became of the incident, and I have since grown up and moved away from my home state. I live in North Carolina now, and I've had a few of my own scary encounters that I will be sharing in the future. I sometimes wonder, what would have happened had my two aunts tried to get into their vehicle, and what sinister ideas the two in that car had planned? I lived around this pond for over 18 years and saw it go from being a small farm pond surrounded by a field and deep forest into a pond sandwiched between three huge neighborhoods and a pool, only shielded by a thin layer of wood surrounding it. As far as I know, the pond was built in the early 1900s and had two barbed wire fence lines running through the pond creating a cross. Why run barbed wire through a pond, I, I don't know. There were only two incredibly old houses to the right of the pond and a neighborhood, a hundred yards through the woods on the left. Growing up, the pond was sort of our local legend, and every kid refused to go explore it. Fast forward ten years and I was an avid fisherman who would spend almost every day after school trying out new waterways in my local area and to try to find the hottest fishing spots. None were as convenient or as plentiful as this pond which I ended up at just about every other day. My first strange occurrence here was when one summer night I stayed out past dark to try and get a few more bites, when all of a sudden, light flooded from behind me as if a big truck had just parked with its brights on. I immediately turned, thinking possibly a car had just parked in its driveway at the houses about 100 yards behind me through the woods. Nothing was there though, 
and from this angle, there were no way headlights could have traveled like that. I decided that that was enough for tonight, and left the trail leading to the nearby pool parking lot. The second one was months later, but a very eventful evening. As I was walking down the trail from the pool to the pond with my fishing bag on my back, I felt clear as day my backpack get pushed from the side as if someone were trying to spin me towards them. This happened in the exact same spot as where I was standing when the light had hit me. I stood there for a second and looked in the water. I thought maybe I had walked into a fishing line or something. To my surprise, there in the water was a small clay statue of a Ganesh and a coconut. Now, seeing Hindu and Indian culture was nothing new to me, as the area I lived in had the highest population density of Indian people in America, and many of my lifelong best friends are Indian. But what shocked me was it was as if something wanted to get my attention and say, check this out. Honestly, this was slightly comforting, as I went from being freaked out from being pushed to be amazed and intrigued by what I believe it was pointing me towards. Story 3 is more of an explanation about the spot that every occurrence seemed to happen at. The spot was just a little entrance in the brush where you could fish from, and it was about a 6 foot by 6 foot area where grass did not really seem to grow for whatever reason, and it had an exotic looking tree that was clearly not native hanging above it, about 10 feet off the ground. In this spot there was almost always a small animal hanging out, which would never take its eyes off of you until you got within 3 feet of it usually a bunny, but often a squirrel or a bird. If there was not an animal there, there might be an object. One time there was a knife, another strange pieces of old wood, colored rocks a different time, and one time, I think it was a $500 watch. It was as if someone was just coming and purposely leaving strange things in this spot, or as if it were spawning here like a video game. Oddly enough, I was never freaked out by this spot and would just go there with friends and hang out on nice days. It had sort of a nice aura to it and looked so interesting that it was hard not to appreciate. This is the last experience I have had at that pond and by far the creepiest and craziest one. One day, me and a buddy of mine and a couple of girls headed up to the pond to hang out after school. While hanging out, conveniently at the same spot, we see a small child about three to five years old come running up from an old house on the other side of the pond. Concerned, we ask the kid what he is doing, where his parents are, and all of that. The kid seems very disinterested in what we are asking him and keeps asking us questions if we're kids or if we are grown-ups. You know, that typical stuff. When all of a sudden, he turns the other way and starts talking to someone that was 100% not there. The person he is talking to is seemingly trying to get him to go back to his parents as the kid seems to be protesting this, saying he just wants to play with us instead. And this is the craziest part. The kid starts barking towards the water and pointing and says, Look, it's my dog, do you see him? As if he is pointing straight towards the center of the pond. We ask where his dog is. He's in the water barking at me. That's where he drowned a year ago. All of us stood there speechless for a moment and then took him back to the other side of the pond where his dad met us to take him home. I know kids have wild imaginations and often have imaginary friends, but this did not seem make-believe to me. It genuinely seemed like he was talking to a fifth person who was not there and was responding to whatever they were saying. I almost feel as if this was one specific spot at the pond that has a sort of video game spawn point effect if that makes any sense. I have half a dozen other crazy stories of things I've seen at this spot, but these are probably the craziest ones. So at the end of August, this guy I was talking to, who is now my boyfriend, he was 43 years old and wears a size 12 shoe, which is important for later, and myself, who is a 21 year old female, went fishing. We went to one of our normal spots a spillway type deal coming off a mountain tucked into a small bowl like valley. There's a nice little pool there, so we go fishing and it is like 10 p.m. We had seriously just gotten there and set up when a giant rock came flying into the middle of the pool. We hollered out, hey, we're fishing down here. Sorry if it disturbed me or camping, but we're, we're done setting up and just want a quiet night. A second later, another rock came flying and landed two feet away from us. 
we decided to go investigate who was chucking rocks at us. I go and shut off our side-by-side -side so there are no lights. We go up to where the rocks seemed to be coming from and did not see anyone or any footprints. We go back down to our little hole and feel like someone is watching us from the side of the valley. I was starting to freak out a little bit, but not knowing what to do or what to say, I just sat there. I'm not really a wimp, usually I'm a big tough girl with a big mouth, but this is something I've never dealt with. Another rock comes flying down into the pool. I clean up my stuff and go to my boyfriend and say I am leaving with or without him. He agrees to leave and we pack up. I tell him I felt like we were being watched from both sides and he agrees. Well, he was angry, so he goes back to check out where we were the next day. He found there was a person camping and had a stockpile of large rocks to throw at us. Whoever it was dug out a hole to sleep in and my boyfriend found footprints. The strange thing about these footprints though is they made his feet look tiny. They were probably a size 15 or so. And where they were camped, they had a perfect line of sight to us. The crazy thing is, we walked right below him and were six feet in front of him and we never saw him even with our headlamps on. I was even looking in his direction at one point. It's crazy. A few decades ago, I was relaxing at the edge of a very public lake, trying to get in on the evening bite. There were about a dozen other anglers taking up my usual spot, so I had to move maybe about 50 feet away. Finding a steep path to the shoreline that was about 8 feet down with the vegetation on both sides that was thick enough that I leaned against the bank from the rock I was perched on, I could pretend I was alone. So, I'm sitting and chilling and waiting for a hungry trout when I hear someone at the top of the path coming down. I figured it is another angler, but no. It is some random dude who sits near the top of the path and starts chatting. Then he scoots down closer to me. At first, I did not mind. He had a distinctive voice, and he had a pleasant conversation until he started talking about how he was coming down from a high. Some sort of drug, I don't know, and apparently he was looking for sex. Then he asked if he can join me on my rock. I was done with him already, so I reeled in to check my bait as I said no. He asked again, and I picked up my fillet knife to cut my line and change the lure. I could have used my nail clippers, but the knife made him stop asking. I ignored him after that and he seemed to get the message and headed back up the trail. He goes away and I start to relax again when I hear his voice. He's standing about 10 feet away at the top of the path, but when he says, well, I guess I'll just jerk off up here. Now I am angry. I get that way when I'm scared. Knowing I am within earshot of other people fishing, I start yelling at him to put his willy away and get out of here before I call the cops. No one did a damned thing. Even as I started climbing the steep path to end this, he must have finished because he was casually getting into his car and drove off before I could reach the top and get a plate number. I was too unsettled to go back to fishing so I grabbed my gear and went home to tell my husband about it. At his suggestion, I called the police and gave them a description of this person, vehicle, and voice, but of course there was nothing they could really do at that point. My anxiety was having a field day with all of this as well, but I figured that was the end of things. Nope. A couple of weeks later, I am at the local grocery store with my young children when I hear that same voice. You know the expression, your blood ran cold? It really felt as though... I had been chilled to the bone. I grabbed the kids and left the cart, rushed to our car, and waited for him to come out. I saw him get into his vehicle, and I wrote the plate number down. The wee ones are starting to freak out because I was freaking out, realizing this loser lived in my neighborhood. I called the cops, again giving them the new information, and they said they would check things out. They called a week later to tell me they talked to a guy who had a buzz cut and did not resemble the guy I told them about because apparently people don't get haircuts. Anyways, they thought the voice sounded the same, but uh, I don't know, they never did anything. I started shopping elsewhere, but never felt comfortable enough to enjoy my solo evening fishing at that lake ever again. Hey Swamp, I'm a long time listener, first time submitting a story though. 
This may not seem scary to others, but it got the attention of me and my fiance real quick. First off, we are from a small town in Georgia, and we love to go fishing whenever we can. This time, I was hoping to work on my aim. We love to go to this creek, but we will keep it anonymous for this story because you're really not supposed to fish there. On Sunday, August 2nd, 2020, we started our day fishing off the bridge to the creek and drinking a few Corona beers to aim at after we drank them. But since the turtles had started to invade the front of the creek, the fish were not really biting all that well. So we decided to go to the back of the creek off a dirt road we had to drive down. When we got there, it was quiet and peaceful. He cast my line and as soon as it hit the water, I had a bite. It was a shell cracker. So we decided to throw it back. But since we were just fishing for sports and not for food, on this day, I had more luck fishing than him. We were on our toes since we had heard the cries of baby alligators from across the creek earlier that day. When we go fishing, we always go armed. This day we had his Glock 40 and my 22 rifle. I mean, you never know what you will run into, but we mainly had them for snakes and gators. But back to the story. As I caught a catfish and he was starting to take the hook out of its mouth, we hear the most ungodly sound come from the woods on our left. It sounded like a mix of a wild boar and a dog getting mauled mixed together. With that, we looked at each other and said, yeah, F this, and we burned the line to the hook in the catfish mouth and threw it back in the water. As I ran and got the 22 rifle and my bags to run back to the car as he got his fishing bag and bait in his Glock and followed behind me with his fishing pole in hand. When we got to the car, we threw everything in the back seat and jumped in the front and when I say we hauled butt up that dirt road with weapons in hand just in case we needed to fire, I mean it. Once we got to the main road, we got the heck out of there and did not look back. We slowed down when we got close to town and continued in silence. We still enjoy going fishing and enjoying our time outdoors. We were always believers in things that go bump in the night and now the daytime as well. We would not let this keep us from our fishing adventures, but one thing is for sure, we will always keep our guns locked and loaded and ready to shoot. Thank you, Swamp, for reading my story, and I hope you enjoyed reading it as much as I did writing it. For the longest time now, my one true passion in life has been fishing. I have a high-pressure job as a stock trader in my hometown of Philadelphia and nothing seems to help me unwind from a stressful week quite like a day's worth of fishing. I think it is the combination of the serene setting, the slow steady pace of it, and the fact that I am reconnecting with nature. When most of my life is spent in a stuffy office space staring at a computer screen. But there has always been one dream fishing trip that I have always wanted to go on, but never really had the time to arrange and that is bow fishing down in Louisiana. Ever since I saw a segment on it on the World Fishing Network, I was just dying to try it. I always wanted to try out archery too, so combining that with my passion for fishing just seemed like the obvious choice. I had mentioned it to my wife once or twice, and being the great listener that she is, she ended up arranging a trip down into the bayou for myself and a few of my buddies for my 37th birthday. We flew down to New Orleans on a Friday morning, which I had no idea was named after Louis Armstrong. Then, spent the day hanging around Bourbon Street, drinking cocktails and soaking up the jazz. Then, after fighting off the hangovers the next day, we drove down along the Mississippi River to this little place called Burris, where we found ourselves at New Orleans Bow Fishing Charters. The guys down there were awesome, sharing all of their little tricks and techniques with us to ensure we would have as much of a lucrative trip as possible. Then, once the sun had set, we loaded up into the boat and set off into the swamps. It really was like a dream come true for me. The landscape down there really is something to behold. But here's the thing. The shallow bottom boat we were on had these floodlights on it, just below the waterline. Most fishermen will tell you that this is basically cheating since the fish tend to be attracted to lights. But since we were just using bows and arrows, 
I guess it kind of evened out the odds. However, having lights on your boat like that totally ruins your night vision. So, as much as you can see the water around you perfectly, it blinds you to the darkened areas beyond. And that makes you feel vulnerable indeed. There could have been anything out there in the darkness just watching us, and we would have absolutely no idea it was ever there. So we are having a ball for the first hour or so, mostly just making fun of each other for missing our shot so much. But eventually, we started getting the hang of this whole accuracy thing. We are pulling in all kinds of black drums, redfish, and flounder, which are delicious, by the way. But I could not see any of the fish I wanted to shoot, and that was alligator gar. I had my heart set on getting my hand on a big 10-footer to show the guys back at the office, but I was worried the entire trip might pass before I get the chance to shoot one. But eventually, one of my buddies is looking over the side of the boat into the brightly lit but murky waters when he calls out to me that he sees a big old gar hiding among some reeds just a few feet away. He knew I was after one, as was everyone, so everyone got out of the birthday boy's way so I could get a clear shot on it. So there I was, right on the edge of the boat with my bow and arrow in hand, trying to get myself a good aim on this gar. Jesus Christ, was this thing huge. I mean, it was easily a 10-footer, the same exact kind of monster that I had been dreaming of getting my hands on, and I really had to regulate my breathing to keep my hands from shaking too much. Only just as I start to get a steady aim on the thing, and I'm about to fire the arrow into the water, it starts to slowly creep further away from the boat, almost like this damn thing knew I had my eyes on it, but I was not going to let it get away. And as dumb as this was, I start leaning over the edge of the boat as to not lose it, that is when I lose my balance, and I start wobbling and tipping over the side of the boat before my buddies could reach out to grab me and reel me in. Bow in hand, I crash into the murky waters head first, getting absolutely soaked in the process. I can hear the guys in the boat laughing their asses off before I even resurface, and when I finally do, I got to admit, I was laughing too. But as I look up from the water, they do not look so cheerful anymore. They are all just looking behind at me, staring at something with these looks of terror on their faces. I'm all like, what's the problem? Before I look behind me, I see a pair of glassy eyes glowing in the lights of the boat just before they disappear under the water. It was a gator, and it was huge. I start scrambling to get back to the boat, trying and failing to scale the side of it before the thing got me. All my buddies rush to my side and try to grab me, but the bow fishing instructor rushes to the opposite side, grabbing one of my two friends and imploring them to do the same. Lest we tip the whole thing over and all end up in the water, just as they get a grip on me and start dragging me upwards, I feel an intense pressure on my right boot. It was horrible. I just start screaming, it's got me, it's got me, over and over, feeling my leg beginning to stretch from the guys dragging me up and the gator trying to drag me down. Then suddenly I am free and the guys can pull me back into the boat, but that did not bring any relief. As in that moment, I can think of, uh, is this how this gator has bitten my damn foot off? There was no pain, but I have heard in those adrenaline-fueled moments you do not feel the mass of injury that has been inflicted on you. I am scrambling around in the boat, trying to get a look at my leg, half expecting to see a missing foot and blood pouring out from the bottom of the boat, but to my infinite, but to my infinite relief, all I see is a soaking wet sock, covering my still-attached foot. The relief. The pure relief I felt in that moment I can hardly put into words, and it did not take me all that long to figure out that a hangover had basically saved my life. Since I was feeling so rough that morning, I had not bothered to tie my boots up all that tight, giving them enough slack to allow the gator to pull it straight off of my foot. It was without the single most terrifying moment of my entire life. Seeing that thing's eyes practically glowing in the floodlights of the boat put the absolute fear of God into me. And I know how lucky I am that I was able to walk away from the situation with all of my limbs still attached and relatively unharmed. I could just as easily bled to death lying on the floor of that boat thousands of miles away from my kids, my wife, and my family while my buddies looked on helplessly. We took a fair amount out of the swamps that night, and I suppose it was only right that the swamps took something back. I did not manage to catch the gar I had been lusting for in the end, but that was okay by me. I am just happy that I did not get eaten 
by an alligator. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true fishing horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, whether it's a fishing story or something else from the outdoors, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that truly help keep this show going on a daily basis. Speaking of that, I upload almost every single day, so why not join us? Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new video. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton in the YouTube algorithm. If you're listening on iTunes or another podcasting platform, give this a 5 star rating as it really helps me out a ton over there. I appreciate all of your guys' support. If you guys would like to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller Scary Stories wherever you go, you can do that on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. And as I always say, it's absolutely free and always will be. I'd love to know in the comments down below what story tonight was your favorite. I'd have to say that last one was. Getting nearly eaten by an alligator is something that I have dreaded most of my life growing up in swamps, especially in the Everglades area, I'll tell you that. If you guys would like to support the swamp outside of hitting that like button and subscribing, maybe check out the merch store. I have t-shirts, hoodies, face masks, and so much more. I'd love to see you guys wearing some cool swamp threads. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting the swamp the way you do. I've got a lot of cool stuff planned for March, and I hope you guys enjoy it. I'll see you guys soon with another creepy video.